Morning, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the uh, Rutenberg Library. Wanted to come to you today with a book haul. Uh, so this week we made a trip into town and and uh, did some shopping. And while they were doing some shopping, um, I did some book shopping. My family was celebrating my mother-in-law's birthday. And I thought, well, why not? It's her birthday. I might as well get some books, right? So I um, wanted to show you what I got and, um, you know, tell me what you think. If you've read any of these, I have none of these are books that I have read before. This is all brand new stuff for me. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I got some World War II, some Civil War, some Theodore Roosevelt. But uh, let me know what you think of these books and put your comments uh, down in the comment section. Um, actually, I'm going to start you off with uh, a couple of comic books. Uh, as I've told you recently, I collect G.I. Joe. That was my comic book of choice, or my, my cartoon of choice, back in the 80s when I was a little kid. And, and I've always liked the comic book, and so slowly but surely, here and there, I'm picking up uh, different copies from the comic book series, and I picked up two different copies. I picked up uh, number 41 in the G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero. Um, and I'll show you that. Like I said, copy number 41. And then I also picked up number 55. Um, I like that one. You got Destro, you got Snake Eyes, and you got uh, Cobra Commander on the front there. It's kind of a neat cover. Um, probably my favorite of the two, but uh, like I said, slowly but surely, I am I am picking up different copies in that series, and my hope is that I can get them all and then read through them all. Uh, they each have very distinctive individual stories. The writing in GI Joe was really good; I liked it. Um, they actually, you know, gave a lot of these characters very realistic traits, stuff that you could kind of latch on to. And, um, yeah, I just really liked it. And it had a really good ongoing story that, that uh, kept everything kind of together. And so my eventual goal is to read all of them. So anyway, uh, the next set of books, these were all from uh, Books Revisited. I went and I had saw online that they actually had this first book. And then I collected a whole bunch of others at the in the meantime. Um, but his first one is Theodore Roosevelt in the Badlands, a young politician's quest for recovery in the American West by Roger L. D. Silvestro. And uh, this I liked the cover. I thought the cover was some was enough to make me want to buy it. But um, anyway, this is a. A 2011 book, and it is Walker and Company out of New York. And uh, let me read the inside cover to you. So, uh, the turbulent years of Theodore Roosevelt spent as a rancher in the badlands of the Dakota Territory played a crucial role in shaping the character and values of the future president and conservationist. On February 12th of 1884, as Roosevelt was building a career as New York State's most promising young politician, his wife gave birth to their first child, Alice. Two days later, on Valentine's Day, both his wife and his mother died in the same house. Grief-stricken and driven by doubts about his career after failed attempts as a reformer fighting political corruption, Roosevelt left Alice in his sister's care and went to live on a Badlands ranch he had bought a year earlier. He spent much of the next three years working alongside his ranch managers and hired hands. He grew to love and respect the frontier life and to find in the West both physical health and emotional stamina. His transformation in the mid to late 1880s from young, Harvard-educated New York politician to a working rancher coincided with the end of the Old West, a turning point in the cattle industry, and major changes in America's attitudes towards wildlife and wild places. Drawing on Roosevelt's own accounts and on diverse archives, Roger L. D. Silvestro tells the exciting story of how Roosevelt's spirit and political dynamism 
uh, were forged during roundups, bronco busts, fist fights, grizzly bear hunts, and encounters with horse thieves, hostile Indians, and vigilante justice. In the dramatic life of Theodore Roosevelt, few adventurers exceeded the those that he found in the Badlands. All right, and so that sounds very interesting. It's a uh, I've always been fascinated with um, Theodore Roosevelt. He um, I think he's just one of those unique American characters. He, um, you know, he just had so much stuff going on in his life, and this was obviously a pretty interesting time and didn't deal with politics. It was more just, um, you know, uh, healing himself emotionally. Now, the one thing, you know, I got a lot of respect for Roosevelt in many ways, but there are some things in his life that I do not have respect for. I think it, it definitely just makes him the character he is, but... One of those things that I don't respect is how he left his child in his sister's care for three years. I, as a father, I really do not understand how he could do that because one of to, I think to me one of the ultimate joys in life is just holding my child. Um, every morning, my four-year-old and she'll be coming down here in probably twenty thirty minutes here uh, after you know getting up from her uh, from sleeping last night. She'll get up this morning and she'll come running in and yelling, Daddy! And she'll jump up and, uh, you know, we hug each other and and uh, we give each other what we call our squeezy hugs. And um, it, it's just one of the best things that I have every single day, uh, especially throughout the summer when school's not going on, uh, you know, those squeezy hugs. And I don't know how he went without his squeezy hugs. Um I just don't understand that. But this should be interesting, you know, looking at, like I said, his life in the West. It definitely um, made him who he was. It definitely developed his character. Uh, and in the middle of the book, I forgot to show you, you know, you do have plenty of uh, black and white photos. Uh, got some really good, there's a picture of his family, some ranching pictures here. Um, Another one, but uh, anyway, oh, there's a good one right there, him from the ranch, but uh, that'll be a good read. That was the most expensive of the books. It's in really good shape. It's pretty much brand new condition. Got it for like six bucks, and so i um, very excited about that. So let's, let's dig into the rest of these. Um, so this was a book as I was just looking through the shelves. This was actually one of the last ones I picked up because I was waiting on my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law to finish looking around the store. And usually what happens is I get a small stack of books. And then as I'm waiting on other people to do their searching, I end up finding other books on the shelf and my stack starts to grow. And this that was the case here. This was one of those I added on afterwards. Uh by Cokie Roberts. This is Capital Dames, The Civil War and the Women of Washington, 1848 to 1868. Now, this was in a large print edition, not usually what I get. I don't usually get the large print. My eyesight's not to that point yet, but, you know, I'll take it. Uh, this is from Harper Collins and... It is a 2015 book, so fairly new. Um, this is uh, Cokie Roberts, author of three New York Times bestsellers, including Founding Mothers and Ladies of Liberty, turns her attention to the Civil War in a riveting explora exploration of the ways in which the conflict transformed not only the lives of women in Washington, D.C., but also the city itself. Her engrossing, well-researched narrative is an inspiring work about increasing independence and political empowerment, honoring those indispensable role of Washington, D.C.'s women and strengthening the city while keeping the lines of communication open with their southern sisters and in facilitating uh, healing once the fighting was done. Compelling social history at its best, Capital Dames concludes that the war not only changed to Washington, it also forever changed the role of women in American society. So um, I do own two of her other books, 
And so I'm real excited to add that to the collection. This will be book three in the Roberts collection. Uh, but that should, that should be a good read, adding to my women's history. Uh, let's see here. Let's go with, here's another book that I picked up after I had my initial stack put together. And this one sounds intriguing. Um, it says, On Hitler's Mountain, Overcoming the Legacy of a Nazi Childhood by Ermagard A. Hunt. And some of you might be familiar with that. I mean, it sounds really interesting. I am not familiar with the author or the story. This is, let's see, Harper Perennial out of New York, and it is a 2005 book. But um, it's got, you know, you got your storyline, and then there's black and white photos in the middle of the the book throughout the text. There's quite a few black and white photos, but um, it says, growing up in the beautiful mountains of, and I am about to butcher the name of this town, so please forgive me. Uh, growing up in the in the beautiful mountains of Berchtesgaden, or Gaden, uh, just steps. From Adolf Hitler's Alpine retreat, Ermagard Hunt had a seemingly happy and simple childhood. In her powerful, illuminating, and sometimes frightening memoir, Hunt recounts a youth lived under an evil but persuasive leader. As she grew older, the harsh reality of war and a few brave adults who opposed the Nazi regime aroused in her skepticism of National Socialist ideology and the Nazi propaganda she was taught to believe in. In May of 1945, an 11-year-old Hunt watched American troops occupy Hitler's mountain retreat, signaling the end of the Nazi dictatorship and World War II. As the Nazi crimes began to be accounted for, many Germans tried to deny the truth on what had occurred. Hunt, in contrast, was determined to know and face the facts of her country's criminal past. On Hitler's Mountain is more than a memoir. It is a portrait of a nation that lost its moral compass. It is a provocative story of a family and a community in a period and location in history that it is fast becoming remote to us, that important resonance of our own time. All right, and so I look forward to reading that. It sounded very, very interesting. So uh, nice, nice uh, memoir. I guess not nice, but uh, compelling memoir of the Nazi regime. And kind of sticking with that same World War II theme, this is uh, Marion in Chains, Daily Life in the Heart of France During the German Occupation by Robert uh, Gildea. And this is a hardback I've, I found. Really good shape. Looks like a brand new book for only two bucks. You can't beat that. It is a 2002 book from Metropolitan Books, which is from the Henry Holt and Company out of New York. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the inside cover to you. A startling and original view of the occupation of the French heartland based on a new investigation of everyday life under Nazi rule. So in France, the German occupation is called simply the Dark Years. It is remembered as a time of hunger, fear, cold, and the absence of freedom. When the French population was cruelly and consistently oppressed by the enemy, there were only the good French who resisted and the bad French who collaborated. Marion and Chains, a broad and provocative history, uncovers a very different story, one in which the truth is more complex and humane. Drawing on previously unseen archives, First-hand interviews, diaries, and eyewitness accounts, Robert Gildea reveals everyday life in the heart of occupied France. He describes the pressing imperative, imperatives of work, food, transportation, and family obligations that led to unavoidable compromise and negotiation with the army of occupation. In the process, he sheds light on such subjects as forced labor, the role of the Catholic Church, the horizontal collaboration between French women and German soldiers, and the most surprising and ambivalent attitude of ordinary people toward the resistance, which, which was often dismissed as a bunch of bandits 
who were militarily irrelevant. A brilliant work of reconstruction, at once thorough, challenging, and readable, Marianne and Chains provides a clear view, unobscured by romance and polemics, of the painful ambiguities of living under tyranny. All right. Um, so, like I said, this should be really interesting. It looks like it's got um, some great maps in it to help tell the story. It's got, in the middle of it, it's got plenty of black and white photos from the time period. So, um, that'll help definitely give the visual of what's going on. But one of the things that I find interesting about war that typically, you know, in a lot of cases doesn't get told is the everyday person's story, not just the soldier and, and who fought who and how, how many people died, but what was life like living in that time period. And I've always found that fascinating. Um, and I've read lots of stuff on the American Revolution and the Civil War, but I have not really... And I've read stuff on the American home front, but I have not dug into the Europe, European home front, those that were not actually fighting, um, kind of like this memoir. So these two books should be uh, just fascinating and, and should, you know, just expand my horizons. So I'm really looking forward to those. Um, the next book uh, is going to go along with my world history class. It's a It's an older book, but... Uh, it still should add to my knowledge because, you know, I've told you before, world history is not necessarily my, my cup of tea when I'm, when I'm teaching just because my knowledge base is not nearly as big as it is when I'm teaching American history. Um, I find it fascinating. I just, I need to continue to expand it. So the next book is The World of the Reformation by Hans J. Hildebrand. This is kind of a, kind of a neat retro cover uh, and there's your author on the back this is from oops, I passed it. Charles Scribner's Sons out of New York and it is a 1973 book so like I said you know a little bit older copy but um, this says when Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis in 1517, he inadvertently precipitated a religious controversy. In the initial stages of that controversy, the response to Luther was widespread and genuine, and the first adherents to the new faith had no intention of breaking with the Roman Catholic Church. Gradually, however, the dissidents divided with the church and among themselves over theological issues. Finally, religion became involved in the power politics of the time. The sacred, uh, the sacred was used to achieve the profane, and the profane was used to achieve the sacred. As rulers and their opposition rallied armies to the cause of religion in countries like Germany, England, France, Sweden, Scotland, and Poland, ultimately then the Reformation was as successful as it was because political considerations added their weight to the religious ones. Using this framework, always stressing the interaction of ideas in society, Dr. Hildebrand explores the major ideas and forces of the Reformation. He rejects a purely theological explanation uh, for the movement as well as the approach that sees socio-political causes in its inception. He thus presents the early part of the 16th century neither as a movement in intellectual history nor as one of the as one that totally lacking in significant ideas. He is concerned with what actually happened, how the Protestant ideas were communicated, how the Reformation spread from country to country, what kind of polemic was employed by the protagonists, what were the characteristics of the chief actors of the drama. As he weaves his narrative around these central themes, Dr. Hildebrand shows the Reformation to be the cohesive phenomena of the early 16th century, the movement that drew together religious, theological, and political forces. So that, I, I think it's going to be fascinating because this is one of those major events in history that totally, you know, just changed the map of Europe and changed the ways of the world. And it's, it's a fascinating thing to look at. And so really looking forward to reading that. 
The next one is a Doris Kearns Goodwin book, one of her one of her original ones, one of her first ones. Uh, this is The Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys, an American saga. And many of you are familiar with this. Um, I have not read this. I love Doris Kearns Goodwin's work. I've read Team of Rivals. I read the one, um, oh, what is the name of it? It, it was on Theodore Roosevelt and Taft in, the, in the, uh, the, the newspapers of the time period. I can't remember the exact name of it. But anyway, um, I've read a couple of those books and really, really enjoyed them. I think she's a great author, and so I really look forward to this. Um, I've been told it's, it's a fabulous work. It's from Simon & Schuster out of New York. And it's from 1987. And so um, this is the, the front cover says, The noted biographer of Lyndon B. Johnson has written the story of three generations of the Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys. The saga begins on a bitter cold winter's day in 1863 with the baptism of John Francis Fitzgerald and comes to its dramatic climax when his grandson and namesake John Fitzgerald Kennedy is sworn in as president in January 1961. In those 100 years, the families rose from poverty and obscurity to a glory and glamour unmatched by any political family in the history of the United States. The saga unfolds appropriately on a large canvas as benefit as befits a family whose eventual triumphs and strengths and weaknesses and mortalities would be inscribed in the chronicles of the world. Act 1, The Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys, is the rise of the Fitzgerald family through the traditional means of big city politics. It is dominated by John Francis Fitzgerald, Honey Fitz, mayor of Boston and founder of the political dynasty. The first Fitzgerald daughter, Rose, is her father's favorite. She is shrewdly political, fiercely religious, unyielding, critical, and far more independent and worldly than she has been traditionally portrayed. This becomes clear in Act Two, which tells not only about the am amassing of the vast Kennedy fortune by Joseph P. Kennedy, but about the marriage partnership between Joe and Rose. Doris Kearns Goodwin draws a surprising and unforgettable portrait of the Kennedy patriarch with access to records never before made public, the author describes just how Kennedy Sr. gained the financial power that he had determined would set his children free of practical constraints. But though he was distant to outsiders, ruthless in business, and a womanizer, to, uh, to his children, Joseph Kennedy was the more forgiving and tolerant parent. Act 3 is dominated by the three eldest siblings. Another older sister uh, was retarded, Joe Jr., Kathleen Kick, and Jack, the Golden Trio. They were, e they were each other's best friends. The oldest son, heir to his father's heart's desire, was killed on a secret mission when his Navy plane exploded over the English Channel in 1944. Kathleen married to the heir of the dukedom of... Uh, Devonshire, then widowed in World War II, died herself a couple years later in a plane crash in France. It is John Fitzgerald Kennedy, sickly all his young life, wounded when his PT boat sank in the South Pacific and devastated by the loss of his brother and sister, who must now slowly recover and take his place as oldest son. There is a great drama in the forging of a new bond between father and second son and in the younger Kennedy's choice of a political career. From this point on until he assumes the presidency and serves his thousand days, it is this Kennedy who will dominate his family. The others will revolve around the brightest son. So this is going to be, I think, pretty interesting. I haven't read a ton on uh, Kennedy and his youth. And so I should learn quite a bit from that. And it's supposed to be a really good book. So uh, the last two that I got from Books Revisited were both Civil War books. Now, these are big books. These are like coffee table books, uh, more for uh, probably just my enjoyment of looking at the pictures. But uh, The Golden Book of the Civil War. And this is, let's see, it says Adapted for Young Readers, uh, from the American Heritage 
picture history of the Civil War with an introduction for Bruce Canton. And of course, I love Bruce Canton. So um, here's that book. And this is from, let's see, the Golden Press out of New York. And it is a 19... 76. This book is from 1976, and this was kind of neat. I got some newspaper clipping in it, but let me show you some of the pictures in here. But it's got it's got maps that are done as pictures, which is really cool. It's got drawings in there, and of course the text goes right along with it. It's got paintings in there, so this is going to be very enjoyable to thumb through. Uh, should be a fairly quick read, I think. And that'll go on my shelf of, uh, you know, big coffee table books. What I thought was really neat was there was a newspaper clipping in here. It's a book review. It says, The Civil War II. What kind of hero was Sherman? And this was, uh, says, reviewed by Martin Hardwick Hall. And it's on the book Sherman's March by Burke Davis. And I have, I have that book and have read it. Um, I enjoyed that book. I thought it was good, but that, that was kind of neat to find that newspaper clipping in there. And what I'll do is I'll go find that book upstairs in the upper room and I will tuck that into that book. And that was kind of a neat, neat little, um, side, side note there. The other book on the civil war that I got was brother against brother and it's from time life books, history of the civil war. The editors of the Time Life Books, forward by James McPherson, one of my favorite authors. Of course, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Battle Cry of Freedom, one of my favorite, all-time favorite books. Um, so there's that book. Again, a coffee table book. Kind of big. Sorry about the glare there. And then the rest of that great painting. That's awesome. Um Here's the, this was kind of neat too. There's the end pages, big old map of the United States. Uh, this is Prentice Hall Press out of New York. And it's a 1990 book. But this thing is just full of different photos. Here's, I think, Andersonville, right? Yep, Andersonville. One of the soldiers that was in Andersonville. It was almost like a concentration camp. what the survivors looked like. Nasty, nasty environment to have to be stuck in. But, I mean, it's just got, it's got photos from throughout the war. Maps. It's got pictures of different magazines from the time period. Anyway, I'm not going to show you all those. But that's going to be great to flip through. And this one's a little bit more of a... Um, detailed history than this other one that first one was now the last two books I'm going to show you were I got these for free they were given to me by my sister-in-law she was going to donate them and she said well if you haven't read them if you want to read them take them and so I said okay I'll try that and the first one is uh, Between Shades of Grey and this is by R Ruta Sepetus hopefully I'm saying that right looked interesting. She said it was, my sister-in-law said it was a really good book, really good fictional book. And this is from Penguin Books, and it is a 2011 book. And it says uh, on the back cover, a knock comes at the door in the dead of night, and Lena's life changes in an instant. With her younger, uh, with her young brother and mother, she is hauled away by the Soviet secret police from her home in Lithuania and thrown in a cattle car en route to Siberia. Separated from her father, Lena secretly passes along clues in the form of drawings, hoping they will reach his prison camp. But will her letters or her courage be enough to reunite her family? Will they be enough to keep her alive? And so um, this was a, a New York Times notable book, an international bestseller, Carnegie Medal nominee, and a winner of the Golden Kite Award. Um, like I said, my sister-in-law said this was a really good book, so I wanted to give that a try. So I'm going to stick that on my book full of fictional stuff. And then the last one is a classic, and I've never read it. I've had another version of it on my shelf. This one is a much nicer version, but this is Alice... Alice's Adventures in Wonderland Through the Looking Glass um, by Lewis Carroll. 
and that cover is fabulous. Look at that cover. That is neat. Um, so really going to enjoy digging into that. Look at that cover, that back cover. That is really cool. Um, but this is said on the front 150th anniversary edition. So that's why it's kind of fancy. Uh, this is from Penguin Books. And it is out of New York, but it is a 2015 edition. So I, it's got both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and then Through the Looking Glass. So it's got uh, both books in there. Really looking forward to that because I've never read it before. So that's another classic I could knock off my list. And it's a beautiful copy. So uh, BookTube. Got a handful of books this week. Tell me what you think of those. I hope everyone's having a, a great reading week. I know I am. This next week I should finish um, Volume 1 of um, Shelby Foote's Civil War series. That should be knocked out. Got that down to about 125 pages. Uh, so I'm hoping to get some reading done today. I also started uh, Ken Follett's Volume 1 of his uh, 20th Century uh, series his trilogy called uh, Fall the Giants, I think, is what it was called. The Giants Will Fall. What? Ah, going blank. The book's in the other room. But anyway, um, got that started yesterday, and, and so far I love it. I love his writing. I'm only a few pages in, but I know I'm going to like it. Just You could tell by the style. But anyway, I hope everybody else is having some uh, so a good reading week, finding some stuff that you're enjoying. Um, tell me what you think of these books that I picked up, if you've read them. Um, and until next time, BookTube, thank you for watching, and happy reading.